audiobook title, Crystal Evolution, 112 to 121, by Sleds. Chapter 112, Why Not Become Friends? Wak Eren tried to make as little movement as possible under her gaze, Professor Malia averted her eyes to look at the class again. Considering my previous explanation, can anyone guess what could be one of the causes other than the heavenly tribulation that could make breaking through to the transcendent realm dangerous? Professor Malia asked her class. The class fell into silence once again. Kieran began to think about Professor Malia's previous words. She explained that one of the differences between the two realms is the awakening of the spirit. Could that be one of the causes? Kieran whispered. Yes. The spirit must be awakened at the same time as the body undergoes the heavenly tribulation, Elzeria replied next to him. Princess Elzeria, would you like to share your knowledge with the rest of the class? Professor Malia suddenly said while looking in the direction of the two. Attention was drawn to them as several surprised voices were raised in the class. Princess Elzeria, isn't that the abomination that all the elves were talking about? She was in our class? This is the first time I've heard she's a princess. Professor Malia must call her like that out of obligation. I don't know what she must have done to make all her people reject her and not even call her by her title. Who's the guy sitting next to her? Doesn't he know that the elves don't want anyone near her? He may not know. He should get away from her quickly. Hearing the voices of the other students. Elzeria looked down at her book. I thought she was part of an important family since she had the name Sile Norin. But she's a princess? Why do the elves warn students to stay away from her if she's their princess? Thought Kieran as he glanced at her. Sigh. The sound of a sigh was heard clearly despite the loud voices of the students. And without any warning, a pressure fell on the entire class forcing them to be silent. All the students' eyes were drawn in another direction as they felt an immeasurable crystal essence coming from Professor Mulia. Today is our first class together, so I will try to be tolerant but know that I do not tolerate any person disturbing my class. If you want to discuss a subject other than my class, do so once this one is over, said Professor Mulia. It was only once she finished her words that she retracted her crystal essence, letting the students breathe again. Is she a transcendent? Kieran wondered when he felt his body free to move again. Princess Elzeria, we are listening to you, said Professor Mulia. Yes, Elzeria replied, nodding and standing up. Depending on the cultivators and the path they want to follow for their future cultivation, there are two to three steps when breaking through to the transcendent realm. The well-known first step is to survive the heavenly tribulation and refine the heavenly tribulation energy. There are several methods to successfully defend yourself from a celestial tribulation, such as the use of defensive treasures or formation array. The second step is to separate one's consciousness. While one part deals with the heavenly tribulation outside of one's body, the other part must enter inside the spiritual world to divide a part of one's soul to transfer it inside the crystal tree to merge with the spirit to awaken it. The more the spirit receives a significant portion of the cultivator's soul, the more powerful it will become when his awakening ends. This is one of the reasons that makes breaking through to the transcendent realm dangerous. If a cultivator fails to properly manage its consciousness to protect its body or awaken the spirit, it may die from the heavenly tribulation or have its soul devoured entirely by the spirit. Unlike any other injury to the soul, merging its own soul with the spirit only has a temporary effect on the cultivators, the spirit being a part of the cultivators and the soul always being in the same body. The recovery of the cultivator's soul will be much simpler. Once the spirit is fully awakened and the cultivator stops merging part of its soul to the spirit, the heavenly tribulation will end, and the cultivator will have reached the transcendent realm. Although the breakthrough can be completed at the second step, there is a third step, which is also the most dangerous. This one consists of opening the crystal essence paths inside the crystal tree, which are connected to the spirit. There are 12 paths in total. These paths can only be opened when breaking through to the transcendent realm, and for each path opened, a cultivator's strength, cultivation speed, and crystal essence pool will increase exponentially. To open these paths, it is necessary to use the energy of the heavenly tribulation. Once the awakening of the spirit begins, the energy must be directed into one of these paths. The spirit that is just awakened will see this action as an attack and will attempt to defend itself by creating a mirage of itself within the spiritual world to attack the cultivator. 
This step is dangerous because it requires the cultivator to defend against the heavenly tribulation, split their soul to fully awaken the spirit, direct the heavenly tribulation energy to open the paths of crystal essence and confront the mirage created by the spirit. Many have died trying to open the twelve crystal essence paths, while most decide to break through by opening only one of these paths, El Zerio explained clearly before sitting down again. Professor Malia nodded at the detailed explanation. That's correct. There is no missing part in your explanation. Now, do you understand why breaking through to the transcendent realm is dangerous? Professor Malia asked her students. However, none of them responded, each realizing the magnitude of such a breakthrough, and just the thought of it made them shudder. Let us continue our lesson on the transcendent realm. Professor Amelia said before changing the image on the holographic board to reveal an image of dozens of men and women. Kieran looked at the board and found a picture of Faith Astoria. Are these the 100 young sovereigns? Kieran thought. Most of you will recognize the people in this image. For those of you who don't, they are the 100 young sovereigns. Professor Amelia paused before continuing. A majority of the students in this class probably dream of becoming one of them. Can someone explain to me why the 100 young sovereigns have the title of young sovereign? Several hands went up at the same time in the class. After being authorized by Professor Malia, one of them stood up to speak. That's because they are the 100 most talented young people in the Aegis Alliance, the student said quickly. This is just one of the reasons why they joined the 100 young sovereigns. It doesn't explain their title replied Professor Mulia. Another student stood up after being allowed to speak. It's because they have a great chance of reaching the sovereign rank before they turn 50. That's right. The transcendent realm is divided into five ranks, just like the mortal realm. These five ranks from lowest to highest are Lord, King, Emperor, Sovereign, and Saint. To become one of the 100 young sovereigns, you must have reached the transcendent realm have the necessary talent to reach the sovereign rank before turning 50 years old, and have performed meritorious acts for the Aegis Alliance, Professor Malia explained. None of the ranks of the transcendent realm correspond to celestial or ethereal. Had the other me in my dream reached the divine realm then? Kieran thought as Professor Malia continued her explanation. Among the 100 young sovereigns of this generation, all have opened a minimum of four crystal essence paths during their breakthrough to the transcendent realm. These are the paths they have chosen to reach where they are today. As of now, most of you are only at the beginning of the silver rank. The journey to reach the transcendent realm will be filled with challenges, but it is to prepare you properly that we have this course. Reflect well on your ambitions and build your foundations correctly because each of the stones that make it is important. For the next hour, Professor Malia continued her lecture, explaining various aspects related to crystal essence. This included emphasizing the importance of purifying both one's body and crystal essence from impurities, especially within the diamond rank, before attempting to break through into the transcendent realm. This precaution aims to prevent the contamination of the spirit during the awakening process. Once the hour ended, Professor Mulia finished her lesson and left the class to leave it to the next professor. Having a short period of respite before their next classes, most of the students began to converse before the next professor arrived. Elzeria looked at Kieran, who was still sitting next to her, before asking, Didn't you say you'll change places for the next class? First, answer the question I asked you before class. Is this what you want or is it just because others are avoiding you? Kieran replied, Didn't you hear them too? I am an abomination. Even my kind shuns me, Elzeria said, lowering her head. I don't think you're an abomination. Elzeria raised her head to look Kieran in the eyes. She expected to find pity in his eyes, but he just looked at her with a sincere face. She felt a warm feeling in her heart as she tried to remember the last time someone looked at her like that, without any malice. You know nothing. She said weakly, you're right, I don't know why they call you that or why they want to keep everyone away from you, but what I do know is that you saved my brother's life, mine, and tens of thousands of lives during the destruction of Uzrin. You don't deserve to be called an abomination, are you getting close to me because I saved your life? Do you feel indebted? If that's the case, you don't have to. You can leave. I'm perfectly fine on my own, Elzeria said as a slight tremor passed through her eyelids. Isn't it exhausting to be alone? Kieran says as he thinks back on the last five months where he has lived through the rifts. Without Runa Harul and Luna, he didn't know what would have become of him. 
he cannot imagine what she must have experienced, rejected by her race and ostracized by the students of the academy because of them. Why not become friends? He said suddenly. There was silence between them for a few seconds before Elzeria finally spoke. You can get in trouble if you stay close to me, she said in a weak voice. It doesn't matter. I usually attract trouble anyway, Kieran replied with a smile. Why is he so nice to me? We don't even know each other, Elzeria thought looking at him without saying a word. As time passed, the next professor entered the class. Kieran quickly recognized him as one of the two professors who had greeted him the day before for his inscription. It's him. Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Andrew, and I will be your professor for combat lessons, Andrew said, quickly introducing himself while glancing in Kieran's direction. Since I don't know the strengths and weaknesses of everyone in this class, we're going to go to the combat field to do a combat practice so I can evaluate you, Andrew explained as a silver light emitted from his body which surrounded all the students before they all disappeared with him. 7. Chapter 113, Combat Practice The students and Andrew reappeared in a large room with several scattered arenas. The majority of the students fell to their knees vomiting while the rest seemed to have no problem related to the spatial displacement they had just undergone. Ah, sorry. I often forget that not all new students are used to spatial travel, said Andrew, laughing. The students who were vomiting on the ground already missed Professor Millier. Andrew made a simple gesture with his hand, and a silver light spread over the students on the ground. The next moment, their expression changed as the uneasiness they felt disappeared. Isn't he too casual for a professor? thought Kieran. As I said before, we are going to do a combat practice where you will compete against each other so that I can evaluate you. Choose a partner for this exercise, and if your ability is support type, don't worry. In order to make this exercise as fair as possible, a training dummy will be provided for you to use. As Andrew finished his words, several formations were activated in the room and training dummies were created around him. Each of these training dummies is identical in terms of combat technique. Their level of crystal strength will be based on your crystal essence. Those with support abilities come to see me to receive your training dummy. Once you have chosen your partner for this exercise, please go to one of the arenas, said Andrew as he began handing out the training dummies to the students with support abilities. Kieran looked at Elzeria who was standing a few steps away from him. Do you want to do the combat practice with me? He asked. Elzeria nodded before heading towards one of the arenas, followed by Kieran. I don't know her strength or her ability. Should I hold back? Kieran thought as he looked at Elzeria, who was standing a few meters in front of him. On the other hand, Elzeria also thought of the same thing. In Azrin, his cultivation had only reached the middle stage of bronze rank. He must have reached the early stage of silver rank by now. His ability lets him transform into a lichen. If I lower my strength to the early stage silver rank, I shouldn't hurt him unintentionally. As the two thought about the combat practice that was about to begin, Andrew's voice was carried through the entire large room. You can start. As if the two had agreed in advance, they waved their hands, making blades of fire and water appear. An expression of surprise appeared on both of their faces for different reasons. Water? It's not lightning? Is it really not her? But if that's the case, then why? Kieran thought as he saw the blades of water. Did he evolve his lick and transformation to add a fire element ability to it? Or was he too exhausted at that time to use it? Elzeria thought as she controlled the power of her water blades to match Kieran's fire blades. As the two threw their attacks to gauge the other's strength. The moment their attacks made contact, something unexpected happened. Instead of clashing, their two attacks seemed to fuse together, gradually becoming a cloud of steam that covered part of their arena. Before the two could even comprehend what had just happened, they felt the will of the other inside the cloud of steam. It was as if they could control us together. What? What? The two shouted simultaneously as they looked at each other with visible shock in their eyes. The two quickly regained their senses, abandoning the control they had over the steam cloud. They created new attacks. Spears of Earth emerged around Kieran, while water vortexes manifested around Elzeria, creating water arrows that soared forward. The two attacks were about to make contact when the same phenomenon happened again. Water and Earth fused forming a torrent of mud on the arena. Kieran and Elzeria looked at each other again before trying one attack after another, but no change appeared. 
No matter how they tried, once their two attacks came into contact, they ended up fusing together. Eventually, as an agreement, the two stopped using their elements. Each of them took a step forward, vanishing from their previous location. A soft explosion was heard as the two emerged in the middle of the arena, Kieran holding his double-bladed sword in his hands and Elzeria her sword. The two clashed in a duel of strength to repel the other. Elzeria quickly moved her sword, causing Kieran to lose his balance. Releasing her grip with her left hand, she hit him in the chest and pushed him back. Kieran gasped for a moment from the blow. Activating both of his abilities, he rushed forward again in his lichen form. Where did he get a double-bladed sword? I thought there were none in this universe. Elzeria thought as she examined Kieran's movements. She couldn't help but glance at his double-bladed sword. Seeing him quickly approaching her, she controlled her strength to lower herself to the same level before taking a step forward. Their two swords came into contact once again. Where did you get that weapon? Asked Elzeria, quickly moving her sword to deliver another blow. I forged it, Kieran said quickly, swapping the position of his two blades to stop Elzeria's attack. Drops of water gathered under Elzeria's feet as she suddenly disappeared before Kieran's eyes, who only saw a strand of silver hairs leave his sight. A shiver ran down his spine as he reacted quickly by moving his double-bladed sword. Clang. The two swords clashed once again. Elzeria continued her rapid assault despite her small size, facing Kieran in his lichen form, who was twice her size. She delivered blow after blow while Kieran resisted, his double-bladed sword dancing around him, blocking each attack from her one after the other. Beginning to feel pressured, Kieran took a step back creating a wall of earth between them. But before he could take a breath, Elzeria created a wall of water that fused with his wall of earth. The next moment, she crossed the wall of mud that had formed following their fusion with a layer of water that covered her body. I really overestimated myself, thinking I could hold back against her. I still haven't grasped the phenomenon that occurs when our two elements come into contact, but she's already using it to her advantage thought Kieran with an ironic smile on his face as he tightened his grip on his double-bladed sword, ready to stop Elzeria's assault. On her side, Elzeria was focused on studying the movements Kieran made with his double-bladed sword. Why do his movements seem so familiar but unfamiliar at the same time? She thought as she struck with a slash, which Kieran dodged by jumping back. The two seemed to delve into their own world as Elzeria had the upper hand in their clash pushing Kieran further and further toward the border of the arena. Professor Andrew, who had watched all the other students' matches, had finally reached their arena. He watched the match with shining eyes. This year's students are not bad, but these two are really something else. I had already seen the little wolf in action, but the elf princess is incredible too. Although she doesn't use all her strength, her control over her crystal essence and her abilities are truly on another level. In addition to keeping her abilities active inside her body, she let nothing appear outside. She even perfectly retains her strength to be on the same level as the little wolf, said Andrew before letting out a long sigh. Elves are really lucky to be able to awaken at the age of five. Even if they can only cultivate once they turn 18, they can train their abilities during this entire period. I wonder if the Alliance will manage to obtain an exchange to receive the formation array which allows an awakening this early. The fight between the two continued, not paying attention to anything that was happening outside the arena. Kieran, who was close to the border of the arena due to being repeatedly pushed back by Elzeria's assault, leapt into the air before creating several platforms of earth on which to lean. Elzeria followed quickly behind him, jumping onto one of the earth's platforms to pursue him. A hint of surprise appeared in her eyes as she set foot on the platform before rushing towards the next one. Kieran, who had reached a higher altitude, turned around suddenly with a dull yellow glint in his eyes. He focused on the earth platform that Elzeria was going to reach to create earth spikes from it. But the moment Elzeria stepped on it, he felt his control over the earth platform being lessened to the point that he could not change its shape. How does she do that? He wondered, abandoning any idea of using his earth platforms to his advantage. Instead, he created more around him to serve as a foothold before propelling himself again into a confrontation with Elzeria. Clang. The sound of the two swords clashing constantly resounded as the two fought in the air, each using the earth's platforms as support to move freely. As they had just exchanged another blow, 
Elzeria stopped on a platform, looking at Kieran in the eyes. Kieran did the same and stopped to look at her. What weapon technique are you using? It looks like an elf technique, asked Elzeria. Answer my question first. How can you control my elemental abilities? Is this part of your ability? Kieran asked in turn. I don't do anything to control your elemental abilities. It just happens. I don't know why either. Kieran frowned at Elzeria's answer. I should ask Master later. He thought, you didn't answer me. Where does this technique come from? Is it a human technique? Elzeria asked again. No. It's an elf technique I learned in a secret realm. The technique is called the Dance of the Heaven and Earth, replied Kieran honestly. So it really was the Dance of the Heaven and Earth, but why is it different from the current technique? Did the secret realm come from an elf from another era? Even so, the technique has changed very little since the first king created it with his wife, so why does it feel so different? Wondered Elzeria. Do you mind if I see the technique? She asked. I'm sorry. The technique was directly transferred into my brain. I can't teach it to you even if I wanted to, replied Kieran. I see. Were you able to learn the first form? Yes. Can you show it to me? Sure. Kieran's lips curled slightly into a smile as his golden blue crystal essence emanated throughout his body before being devoured by his blades. Elzeria's eyes became sharper and a golden blue crystal essence also emanated from her body to be absorbed by her blade. Earth-shattering? She knows the dance of heaven and earth too? Thought Kieran as the smile on his face widened. He leaned on the earthen platform to dash forward, and Elzeria did the same. The giant's ability moved quickly through Kieran's body before reaching his arms. At the same moment, both swung a slash forward. Earth-shattering, earth-shattering, with their voices in unison. The training room was covered by a golden hue, the students were suddenly frozen in this golden world while their bodies shook unconsciously. These two are really something, Andrew thought as a silver sword appeared in front of him. The space around it seemed to twist under its presence. Taking the sword, Andrew made several cuts towards Kieran and Elzeria's arena. As if they were separated from the world, all the golden light was restricted within the confines of the arena. Inside it, all the earth platforms had been destroyed due to the power of their blows. They pushed each other back while their crystal essences were infused into their blades. Kieran's crystal essence exhausted quickly to maintain the power of his blow, but in just a few seconds, his crystal essence was emptied, his face began to turn pale, and blood started to drip from his lips. Seeing this, Elzeria frowned as her strength suddenly increased. She easily pushed Kieran away before retrieving her crystal essence and leaving the arena. Kieran, who had twisted his body through the air to land safely, watched her leave the arena with a disconcerted expression on his face. Andrew Illustration Spoiler Collapse 8 Chapter 114 Lunch It was a great match, Andrew said as he moved closer to Kieran in the arena. Thanks, replied Kieran who had his eyes fixed on Elzeria, who walked away to a corner of the room to sit down. Andrew smiled at the sight before continuing, Would you be interested in becoming my disciple? Kieran finally looked at him. Sorry, I already have a master, he said. Oh, is that true? Too bad for me. I'll still be able to teach you during our combat classes. Kieran nodded before heading towards Elzeria. Why does she seem upset? Kieran thought when he was close enough to see her face. He sat down next to her before asking, Did I do something wrong? Elzeria, who had looked at him since he got closer, finally turned her gaze towards him. Her two golden eyes made him lose all sense of the surroundings. Why didn't you give up before getting injured? She asked. It was a combat practice. It's normal to get hurt if I give it my all, right? He replied. Precisely, it's practice. I was controlling my strength so you won't be injured. Yet, you continued to fight even when you exhausted all your crystal essence. You don't have to injure yourself to continue fighting in a combat practice. Is that why you're upset? Elzeria suddenly frowned. I'm not upset. She's upset. I thought there was a chance she was the girl in my dreams with the strange reactions of my body since I saw her, but it seems they're not the same person. They don't even use the same element. Is my body reacting like this just because she's beautiful? Kieran stopped thinking for a moment, 
admiring Ilzeria's face before snapping back to reality, well, she's not just beautiful, she's out of this world, the only one I could think of who could compare to her is the elf queen I saw in my dream, she even has a good personality, I don't understand why the elves call her an abomination, classes are almost over, do you want to come with me to the cafeteria, asked Kieran, changing topics, I already told you that you might get in trouble if you stay near me, replied Elzeria and I told you it wasn't a big deal. Elzeria looked into his eyes and saw that he wouldn't give up no matter what she said. She let out a long sigh. Okay. Once Professor Andrew's class was over, all the students left their class to go to their respective activities. Kieran and Elzeria walked together towards the cafeteria under the eyes of several students, including Elves, who glanced at them with dark looks. Ding. Kieran received a message from his brother telling him to meet in the cafeteria. He answered him quickly before continuing on his way with Elzeria. Not long after, they arrived at the cafeteria, had their meal, and found a place to sit. Ryan arrived shortly after. He froze for a moment when he saw Kieran and Elzeria sitting next to each other before sitting across from Kieran. Who is it? Elzeria asked. This is my younger twin brother, Ryan. Ryan. This is Elzeria. Kieran quickly made introductions between the two. Nice to meet you, said Ryan before starting to eat. They didn't look alike, except for a few details of their face. But can they really be called twins? Elzeria thought. While the two of them were twins and looked alike before, except for the colors of their eyes and hair, due to the cultivation of the heavenly sun body, Kieran's body became greater, he was taller than Ryan and even his appearance became more refined due to the technique refining all part of his body, including his skin. Looking at the two, her eyes finally stopped on Ryan, I remember you, you came to thank me in the orbital shuttle for saving you and your brother, you saved us, it was normal to thank you, said Ryan as he ate. Elzeria looked around when she felt eyes on her, she saw several elves looking in their direction, she looked away from them before looking at Kieran, are you sure you don't mind being close to me, you might not worry about yourself, but the other students might ostracize your brother for being near to me, she said, I'm not here to make friends, I have my brother here, even if the students in my class ostracize me, it won't make any difference, I'm busy improving myself, I don't have time to get to know them anyway, Ryan replied before Kieran could say anything, you heard him, said Kieran, starting to eat, Elzeria looked at the two brothers for a moment before eating too, when was the last time I ate with someone, was it 14 years ago, just before grandpa left on his journey, she wondered before glancing in Kieran's direction, a friend, is it really okay for me to have one? Are you going to try the heaven reaching tower trials? Ask Tryon suddenly. I think so. I need to get merit points to buy the martial arts hall movement technique. Do you want to go with me? Replied Kieran. Okay, said Ryan. And you? Do you want to come with us? Asked Kieran, looking at Elzeria. No. I've already passed the trials. Until I improve, I won't be able to beat my previous record. She replied. What rank did you reach? Kieran asked intrigued, for the ranking of our age group, I am first, she said, clink, the sound of a fork being dropped was heard as Kieran and Elzeria looked at Ryan, who had a look of shock on his face, you are the first, said Ryan, raising his voice, Elzeria nodded slightly, what is happening to you, asked Kieran, the first in our age group has reached floor 87 of the heaven reaching tower, surpassing most fifth year students, she has a strength equal to an early stage diamond rank, Ryan explained, staring at Elzeria, you're a diamond rank, asked Kieran, turning his head towards her, no, I'm at the gold rank, answered Elzeria honestly, no wonder I lost to you, you would have lost even if I was at the silver rank, how can you be sure, you still haven't reached the second rank of the elemental affinity cultivation, I reached it when I was at the bronze rank, besides, your elemental abilities seem ineffective against me. Kieran frowned at her words, do you really not know why our elemental abilities react like that? No. Kieran thought back to his fight with Elzeria. He cannot understand how this phenomenon occurs or why it only appears with her. He thought back to when he wanted to create earth spikes with his earth platform, only to be unable to do so when she placed a foot on it. Can you create a water bubble? He asked suddenly. Elzeria looked at him before putting down her fork and raising her right hand in front of him. A fist-sized water bubble quickly formed above her hand. 
Kieran looked at the bubble and moved his right hand over the bubble. His expression changed as he could feel a connection with the water bubble. He could even influence it. He focused on this feeling, and the water bubble between their hands began to change shape. The two looked at each other at the same time before Elzeria made the water bubble disappear and looked away. You see, it's not just me, you too, can influence my elemental ability, she said, picking up her fork to continue eating. Kieran stared at his right hand, trying to remember the feeling he just had when changing the shape of the water bubble. On his side, Ryan watched the two as if they were in their world, excluding him. Who am I? What am I doing here? Why do I feel like the third wheel? He thought before looking into Kieran's eyes, at least he doesn't seem so gloomy since he met her. Once their meal was finished, the three left the cafeteria, and Elzeria said goodbye to them before going on her own, leaving the two brothers alone. 6. Chapter 115, An Exalted Race Kieran watched Elzeria walk away before turning back to his brother, who smiled at him. What's wrong? asked Kieran. You seem to like her, Ryan replied. Why do you say that? You didn't stop smiling at her every time you glanced at her. Did I smile? Kieran thought as he moved his hand to his face, feeling the edges of his mouth lift upwards. I just want to be friends with her, he said. The only person I heard you call like this was Thomas, said Ryan with a weak smile. The smile on Kieran's face faded, his gaze falling to the ground as his hands clenched into a fist. What am I doing? I should focus on improving myself rather than trying to make a friend. He thought while memories of his Rin resurfaced in his mind, making him feel ashamed of smiling a moment ago. Ryan suddenly became aware of his words as he saw Kieran's face change drastically. I'm sorry, it's nothing, let's go. Ryan nodded, and the two left toward the heavenly reaching tower. Tell me more about the tower trials, Kieran asked. The trials are relatively simple. As I already told you, the tower has many floors. On each floor, we must face a different number of cultivators, crystal beasts, or other races of a rank and a precise level of crystal essence created by the formation's array of the tower. The first floor consists of facing a bronze rank opponent with a crystal essence level of 500. For the second floor, the number of opponents increases, reaching 3. On the third floor, the number reaches 5. This is how the floors of the heaven reaching tower are divided. Once the third floor is passed, you start again with a single opponent but with a crystal essence level of 600. Does every three floors of the tower only increase the level of crystal essence by 100? No. This is only valid for the bronze rank. Every three floors, the level of crystal essence of the trial's opponent increases either by 10% or by one rank. Once you have managed to face five opponents at the peak of the rank, Kieran calculated quickly in his head before opening his mouth again. So the 87th floor trial that Elzeria reached involves facing five rank diamonds with a crystal essence level of 300,000? Yes. I don't know her strength, but to call her a genius would be an understatement. The second in our age group has only reached the 62 st floor. As the two moved towards the heavenly reaching tower, two elves who appeared to be the same age as them stood in their way, preventing them from moving forward. One of them looked at Kieran before turning to the elf next to him. Lyral, is he the human who dares to talk with the abomination? He asked. Yes, Neldorin. That's him, replied Lyral. Kieran, who was watching the two, suddenly frowned at the mention of an abomination as his gaze turned dark. Why are you looking at me like that humble human? Do you think because she talks to you, you're special? Don't you know she's an abomination, or does her beautiful face fool you? Said Neldorin. The two elves started laughing. I thought elves were an exalted race, but apparently, they also have some trash among their race, said Kieran with a smile. He doesn't know why he reacted like that. The thought of it didn't even cross his mind. He just couldn't control himself when he heard their words. The two elves stopped laughing at the same time, their gazes becoming fierce as they stared at Kieran and Ryan. How dare you insult us, said Lyral. I was just thinking of warning you to stay away from the abomination, but it seems you need a lesson, said Neldorin. As Neldorin was about to release his crystal essence, Lyral placed his hand on his shoulder. We can't do that here, the rules forbid us, he said. T.S.K. You're lucky. If I bump into you in one of the rifts, 
I'll make sure you pay for today's insult, said Neldorin, turning around to walk away. Why wait to meet me in a rift? There are combat arenas not far away, said Kieran. You, Neldorin began to speak when another voice interrupted him. Since there are two of you, we'll have a duel in pairs since my brother's time is precious. And, as we don't want to waste a second for nothing in your company, why not bet some academic merit points? Unless you're afraid of us humble humans, that is, Ryan suddenly said. Kieran looked at him sideways as the smile on his face grew. A vein appeared on Neldorin's forehead as he was about to burst into rage. Liral stepped in front of him, looking at Kieran and Ryan. Okay, we will bet 1,000 academic merit points each, he said, smiling. Ryan glanced at his brother, who nodded. All right, since your time is precious. We will make sure that this fight only lasts a few seconds, replied Neldorin, smiling at them, but his eyes shone with a cold light. The four set off in the direction of a combat arena, attracting the attention of many students on the way. It's not Neldorin and Liral, asked a student. Those ranked in the top 200 of the second years, replied another. Yes, but who are the humans behind them? I've never seen them. They're heading to the combat arenas, aren't they? Let's go see. As a dozen students followed behind them, the four arrived at the academy's combat arenas. Each arena was large enough to accommodate 20 fighters on it. All of them had functions to create protection for the public, to change the environment within the arena, and even a function to bet on the matches taking place inside. The four entered the arena. Liral activated the betting functions, and quickly, a holographic window appeared in front of Kieran and Ryan. After sending 400 points to Ryan, the two accepted the bet, and a layer of protection formed around the arena. A timer materialized in the center of the arena, and a countdown began, announcing the imminent start of the fight. Neldorin and Liral released their crystal essence. At the same time, an illusion of their crystal trees appeared behind them, each with two gems intertwined in their roots. As the countdown neared its end, Kieran and Ryan talked calmly. Their crystal essence level is around 2000, said Ryan. Why do they let their crystal trees appear like that? asked Kieran. Some races do not hide their crystal trees to intimidate their opponent. Is this supposed to have an effect? asked Kieran, confused. At our rank, not so much, but I have heard that in the transcendent realm, with the help of the spirit, the possibility of frightening an opponent with the illusion of one's crystal tree is possible. I see. Neldorin and Liral frowned when they saw the two being so relaxed. The timer finally reached zero, and the two took a step forward. Living forest summoning. Entwined vine dragon. A dozen trees quickly sprouted around Neldorin and Liral. Once their growth was complete, the trunk of each one split open revealing a humanoid creature made of wood that charged forward. Several vines grew from the ground around Liral, intertwining to form a dragon made of vines that rushed toward Kieran and Ryan. Kieran, who was about to create blades of fire, stopped when he saw Ryan stepping forward with his hands in his pockets. As the wood beasts and vine dragon got closer and closer to them, Ryan raised his hand to eye level, lifting his index and middle fingers. His crystal essence seemed to intertwine between them. Impalement barriers. Multiple spike-shaped barriers appeared in an instant, impaling the wooden beasts and the vine dragon. Another ten of them materialized a few millimeters from piercing Neldorin and Liral heads. The two elves stood frozen in place as an incredulous look appeared in their eyes. A cold sweat ran down their spine as they felt the number of barriers ready to impale them at any moment. The next moment... Another scene shocked them as they saw the wood element in their creations slowly being absorbed by the barriers that had impaled them, weakening their abilities. Ha ha ha. A laugh was suddenly heard behind Ryan, who turned his head to seek Kieran holding his stomach as he laughed. Kieran wiped the tears from his eyes before looking at Neldorin across the arena. Thank you for saving our time. You were right. This fight really lasted a few seconds, he said, holding back another laugh. The faces of the two elves turned dark, but they said nothing and cancelled their abilities. Ryan did the same, and the two elves left the arena, leaving the two brothers alone. A message appeared in front of them, telling them that their opponent had abandoned the match and transferred 1,000 merit points to their account. As the two left the arena, Kieran glanced over at his brother. You've really gotten stronger these past few months, he said with a proud smile. Obviously, I won't be a burden to you anymore. 
replied Ryan as he continued to walk towards the heaven-reaching tower. Kieran followed quickly after him. The students who had come to watch them much watched them leave while chatting among themselves. Aren't elves supposed to be strong? Everyone says they are capable of taking on enemies of a higher crystal essence level than theirs. How could they lose so quickly when only one of them made a movement? Did anyone record the match? Yes, I recorded everything. Post it to the academy forum. Very quickly, without the two brothers knowing it, a video of their match was uploaded to the academy forum attracting thousands of views. 7. Chapter 116, Heaven Reaching Tower How did you manage to create so many barriers earlier? Weren't you limited to a certain number? Kieran asked on the way to the Heaven Reaching Tower. I have managed to increase the number of barriers I can create by reducing their size and defense. With my breakthrough to silver rank, my crystal tree now increases my senses, awareness, and concentration. I can analyze a large amount of information and I have more control over directing and dividing my ability as well as my crystal essence thanks to this, Ryan explained. If their defense is reduced, depending on the opponent's ability, they will be useless, right? Yes, but it is quite effective against cultivators with abilities like these two elves. Their bodies are not as strong as those with reinforcement abilities. They also don't have a speed greater than the creation of my barriers to be able to escape them. Have you tried how strong your barrier is? If I use all my concentration and my crystal essence to maintain a single barrier around me, I can defend against a late stage silver rank attack for 30 minutes. But I wouldn't be able to counter attack it. Your ability is a cheat. I would have preferred to have abilities like yours. I would have to think less in fights. Hey, I have to think when I fight too, if you say so said Ryan with a doubtful look as he walked away. That brat, said Kieran, clenching his right hand into a fist. The two soon arrived at the heaven-reaching tower, their eyes drawn to the colossal structure covered in ancient inscriptions, exuding an ancient aura. A crowd of students at the tower's base looked excitedly at a floating holographic display. These screens displayed numerous names detailing rankings for various age groups and the general ranking in mortal and transcendent realms. Cheers broke out periodically as some names changed positions, sparking excitement among the spectators. Among them, a group of elves made more noise than the others. Prince Villain, Prince Villain, Prince Villain. Kieran looked at them before asking, what are they doing? A student near the two brothers heard him and answered, the elf prince, Villain has come to challenge the first places in the mortal realm ranking, he has just reached second place and still hasn't come out on the floor he is currently, he just has to last longer than the first place to take his place, hence their enthusiasm, Kieran looked up at the mortal rankings and saw the name Vilin Sialnorin listed second with floor 109 written beside it, Sialnorin, is he Elzeria's brother, is he the same villain who saved Thomas and me in my dream? If he was a prince, why did he go to Azran by himself to save the inhabitants? Kieran thought as he stared at Valin's name. Why does he just have to last longer than the first place? Can't he pass the floor? Kieran asked. Ryan was the one who answered his question. Floor 109 is the entrance to the transcendent realm. Those who reach this floor face a lord rank. The disparity between the two realms is too wide. No one has ever passed this floor when they were in the mortal realm. The heaven-reaching tower is known throughout the Aegis Alliance. Every year, many geniuses come from their academy to try their luck, aiming to have their names on the rankings. However, only a handful have succeeded in passing this floor, and most of them were geniuses with a double awakening. The last person to pass it without a double awakening is the current president of the Aegis Alliance. 4,000 years ago, as the two chatted, Villain's name came to the top, prompting another shout of cheer from the elves. Let's go, said Kieran before entering the tower with Ryan behind him. Once inside, the two were greeted by a long hall decorated with ancient inscriptions. At the end of it, two circles of formations array glowed with ethereal light. The formation on the left gives access to the trial, while the one on the right gives access to the cultivation room. Position yourself on it to activate it, and you will receive the information necessary to use them directly in your brain, explained Ryan. Following his brother's explanations, Kieran positioned himself in the middle of the left formation circle. The next moment, 
a flow of information entered his brain, explaining to him how to use the two formation circles. Each of them checked the identity of each person before allowing them to enter the floors to which they had access. With a simple thought, Kieran disappeared, followed closely by Ryan. As the two began their trial, outside the tower, a shocking sight appeared before everyone causing a wave of shock throughout the entire academy. Next to the name Villain Sile Norin, floor 110 could be seen displayed for all to see. When Kieran opened his eyes, the scene before him had changed to a forest. Is this the first trial? He said before spreading his crystal sense around him. He felt something quickly approaching him. Turning his head in its direction, he saw a moving figure of shadow and mist. Its eyes illuminated with a supernatural light rushing towards him clenching his hand into a fist. He punched forward, but his fist passed through the beast in front of him. The shadows and mist taking the shape of a claw that moved toward its head. Taking a step back, Kieran dodged the attack before waving his hand, creating a ball of fire that incinerated the beast made of shadows and mist. First floor passed, gained ten academic merit points. An ancient voice echoed in the forest. I only earned ten academic merit points. As Kieran talked to himself, a small orb that appeared to be a pure compressed crystal essence appeared floating in front of him. Is this what Ryan told me about the tower trial being beneficial for cultivation? Bringing his hand closer to it, the orb was absorbed into his body before entering his spiritual world. The scene before him changed once again the forest disappearing to give way to an ancient battle arena covered in blood. Two men and a woman dressed in elegant clothes opposed Kieran. Their hair was a shimmering blonde while their eyes were blood red. The three's irises widened when they saw Kieran, veins appearing around their eyes as they opened their mouths, revealing sharp teeth. The blood on the arena began to move around them as if obeying them. The three moved their fingers, which had changed, now possessing long sharp nails, towards Kieran. The blood moved at their will, turning into arrows of blood that rained down on him. Kieran created a wall of flame in front of him to stop the blood arrows before splitting it into three blades of fire, which decapitated the three in front of him. A trickle of blood escaped the bodies of the three before attaching to their heads, returning it to its initial position and healing the burn on their necks as if nothing had happened. Kieran frowned before creating three giant fireballs that incinerated the three leaving no trace of their bodies behind. Second floor passed, gained fifteen academic merit points. The same ancient voice echoed around him again, and another orb, a little larger than the previous one, appeared. The reward has increased by five academic merit points. Is this the case for each floor? If that is the case, I would not be able to obtain the ten thousand academic merit points needed to purchase the earthbound stride technique. Picking up the orb, it was once again absorbed into his spiritual world on its own. The scene before him changed again at that moment. Vampire illustration. Spoiler. Collapse. 7. Chapter 117. Master Inscriptionist Association. In a part of the Transcendental Academy of Austrian, Elzeria walked inside a building with a sign above its door indicating Master Inscriptionist Association. Walking slowly through the entrance hall, many students' eyes fell on her and the murmurs she had been accustomed to since arriving at the academy were heard one after the other. Elzeria didn't pay attention to their words and continued to walk towards the reception desk while looking at her silver bracelet. Some of the inscriptions on its surface were disabled. I turned it off because it seemed broken, but why do I feel like people around me notice me more than before? She thought to herself as she arrived at the counter. Hello, she said to the employee who looked at her with eyes that seemed filled with disgust despite the smile he displayed. Welcome. How can I help you? said the employee. One of the inscriptions on this bracelet appears to be defective. I would like to have it checked, she replied, showing her bracelet. The employee glanced at the inscriptions but couldn't determine their functions or whether one was defective. The level of the inscriptions on this bracelet is higher than my capabilities. Can you give it to me so that I can have it checked by someone more competent? Asked the employee, still wearing a fake smile. Yes, replied Elzeria, taking off the bracelet from her wrist. Suddenly, a deafening silence filled the hall. Every pair of eyes that looked in her direction seemed to be in a trance. Elzeria handed her bracelet to the employee, but he seemed unconscious as his eyes were fixed on her. Excuse me, said Elzeria but the employee still didn't answer. As she was about to call him again, 
A voice came behind the employee. What are you doing, idiot? You don't see that a customer is waiting. Stop daydreaming and move aside. The employee was pushed aside and seemed to come to his senses while looking at the man who had just arrived. S. Sorry, Professor Wenxin, said the employee, bowing to the man. Professor Wenxin seemed to be wearing different clothes from the other professors Elzeria had seen so far. His eyes were a dark blue, while his equally colored hair was spiked backward with a braid cascading down his back, along with an accessory resembling an orb attached to the end of the braid. Excuse my employee for his incompetence, Princess Elzeria, Wen Xin said, bowing slightly before continuing, as an apology, I will personally check the inscriptions on your bracelet. Thanks, replied Elzeria, holding out her bracelet. Inscriptions appeared above Wen Xin's hand before flying around Elzeria's bracelet momentarily. There is no problem with the two inscriptions on your bracelet, he said. Are you sure? Yes. The inscription to obscure your presence from the senses of others and the one that reduces your natural charm are both in perfect condition. It's a waste that someone like you uses both of these inscriptions. But I can understand why, seeing these students who seem lifeless, replied Wen Xin while looking at the students in the hall who had their eyes fixed on Elzeria. Elzeria didn't react to the professor's words. She had long become insensitive to such compliments, whether veiled or explicit. In the Elven Kingdom, she was considered an abomination and a sinner. Yet her beauty was a topic frequently discussed by the elders. There was a time when she overheard them discussing a plan to make her smile in front of a guest so they could easily marry her off and secure resources for the elves in return. Such words that compliment her beauty didn't instill any joy in her. Instead, she only felt disgusted towards herself and the life she lived, making her often think about the reason she was born, whether it was to be a perfect, smiling doll for the elder's guests or a caged bird with broken wings, condemned to a life of isolation and rejection. Since the day she overheard the elder's conversation, she had stopped smiling, though she had very few occasions to do so, given the hostility of her race towards her in the first place. She had no intention to become their doll. Is there a reason why their effect doesn't work on a person? She asked, wearing her bracelet again while activating the inscriptions engraved on it. The students seemed to come to their senses at the same time. Avoiding any glances in her direction, the inscriptions on your bracelet were created to affect even Lord Rank cultivators. There are only three ways to bypass their effect. The person is of a rank higher than Lord. They possess an ability or artifact rendering their effect ineffective, or you manipulate the inscriptions to prevent them from affecting that person. I see. Thank you, Professor Wenxin, said Elzeria before leaving. Sigh. What a shame she's not my future sister-in-law. She would be much better than this fury, Wenxin whispered when he suddenly felt a chill on his back. Is this fury sent spies into my association? He wondered looking around before giving up to return to his office. Elzeria left the association, looking at her bracelet. Does he have an artifact that negates the effects of the inscriptions on my bracelet? She wondered, pressing a button hidden on her bracelet. A holographic screen appeared before her, allowing her to access the Aurora Net. As she was about to search for information on the Academy Forum, a video caught her attention. Is it Kieran and Ryan? Why are they fighting elves? Is it my fault? She asked herself anxiously as she played the video. Her anxiety disappeared quickly as her gaze moved towards the heaven-reaching tower. I wonder how they're doing. A notification suddenly appeared on the Academy Forum. The limit of the mortal realm ranking has been broken. Elf Prince Valin joins the geniuses who have succeeded in passing floor 109. Elzeria's gaze grew firmer as she read the notification while her hands clenched into a fist. She turned around before heading towards the training grounds. Kieran ascended through the floors quickly. With each floor, the difficulty increased while the academic merit point reward also increased by five. After three hours inside the tower, he finally began to reach his limits on floor 39 by facing five silver rank opponents with a crystal essence level of 7000. Floor 39 was filled with volcanoes that erupted from time to time, filling the sky with volcanic ash and making the surroundings dark. A few meters in front of him, two beasts covered in molten magma that constantly changed shape, resembling a nightmarish fusion of lava flows, rock and pulsing veins of liquid fire roared in his direction. Beside them, 
three mounds of cooling magma solidified before his eyes. These beasts were called Ignorok. They were born in the heart of volcanoes. Their physiology resembled golems, with a core in their body that served as a heart. On his side, Kieran's condition was not optimal. He was breathing heavily. His crystal essence was almost depleted due to the numerous opponents he had to face until there, and all along his left arm were burns revealing his flesh. Despite being in an illusion created by the tower, he could feel the pain as if it were real. One of the two Ignorocks in front of him began to distort what looked like a twisted hand extended from its body. Kieran held his left arm in pain as he dodged the attack. The ground beneath his feet turned a fiery red hue, the temperature rapidly rising. Without a moment's hesitation, he leapt backward, and in the blink of an eye, a wave of molten lava erupted from the very spot he had occupied just moments ago. Roar, the other Ignorok that hadn't moved yet began to let out a scream, what looked like a deformed mouth on its body twisted, an intense heat seemed to gather inside as an incandescent red light emanated from it. The Ignorok opened its mouth wide the next moment, spewing a gigantic lava ball towards him. A yellowish tint shone in Kieran's eyes as he erected a thick wall of earth before him. The ball of lava hit the earth wall, destroying it in its path. Kieran took advantage of the shorter delay his earth wall gave him to escape the area. The ground shook violently as the ball of lava fell, causing him to lose his balance and quickly jump into the air before falling. He suddenly felt something approaching him, but he had no time to react before he understood what had just happened. He felt an intense burn in his back, which pierced him. His vision blurred, but he could see that one of the Ignorocks had extended a part of its body, piercing through his back, with the other part protruding from his chest, while the areas near the entry point began to melt under the intense heat. His vision quickly went black. When he opened his eyes, he found himself in an empty room in front of an array formation his body in perfect condition. 39th floor failed. Ranking updated. Current ranking 97th among second years. 1000 academic merit points awarded for reaching the top 100 ranks. The old voice still echoed around him. A notification from the academy arrived at the same time. Congratulations on reaching your current rank. A monthly reward is granted based on your rank. Monthly reward. 1000 academic merit points. Monthly reward. One hour access to the elemental training grounds. Kieran blinked several times at the rewards he had just received before quickly accessing his academy account to check his academic merit points. The number 8565 appeared on it. I haven't reached the 10,000 points needed for the earthbound stride technique, but I'm not far from it. I can try to take some tasks to forge to get the rest of the points. Depending on Ryan's level in the inscriptions, we can even try to create an artifact together. Plus, I even got an hour of access to the elemental training grounds, he said, smiling. Has Ryan finished? Calling his brother, Kieran received no reply in return. I wonder where he's at, he said before entering the formation array and returning to the tower's ground floor. When Xin and Ignorok Beast Illustrations, Spoiler, Collapse 7 Chapter 118 Angel Floor 25 of the heaven-reaching tower Ryan stood in the middle of what appeared to be a palace made of pure, dazzling white stone. His emerald green eyes moved toward the sky, reflecting delicate white feathers that slowly fell until his eyes stopped on a winged figure. A woman was flying in the air above him, wearing white armor and a helmet. A golden halo floated delicately above her head. Her long golden hair fluttered in the wind while white wings spread behind her back propelling her with a gentle, rhythmic flutter through the sky. Her pure white eyes seemed to be filled with disdain as she stared at Ryan on the ground. An angel, Ryan whispered, stunned by the sight before him. From what he had learned at the academy, angels were one of the peak races that the Aegis Alliance had encountered through the rifts. Almost every individual of their race has a crystal tree related to the element of light. Seeing it and reading it were two entirely different things, and despite knowing his situation, Ryan couldn't help but observe the angel in front of him. At least, that was the case until the angel made her first move. The angel raised her right hand high into the sky, and the next moment, ten spears made of light appeared behind her back. Lowering her hand, the spears fell one after another towards Ryan. Ryan quickly took a stance while moving his right hand in front of him. 
his index and middle fingers raised like during his fight in the arena. This same movement that he has repeated tens of thousands of times in these past few months has become imprinted in him. It wasn't a special technique that he had learned from a master. It was just a set of hand movements that he had found in an ancient book that was supposed to help him concentrate and direct his energy. He had searched for information everywhere he could to improve himself even a little, and although at that time he found the idea of using hand movements to concentrate laughable, he had quickly discovered that his mind would strangely calm down when he performed these movements that seemed so simple. And as the spears of light quickly approached him, he whispered, Barrier. A barrier barely larger than him surrounded him, blocking the spears of light that shattered into bursts of light on impact. The barrier shook slightly for a second. The next moment, tiny particles of light left by the remains of the spears were absorbed by his barrier, which took on a slight white glow. Ryan only glanced at the particles of light once before directing his crystal essence through his ability. Dozens of spike-shaped barriers appeared around the angel, aimed at her white wings. But before they could reach her, a white light escaped from the angel's body, taking the form of a bright white bell, protecting her from Ryan's attack. The angel spread her two wings, making the bell disappear. The bursts of light around her seemed to give her a divine appearance. A long sword of light appeared in her hands, as she fluttered her wings, moving quickly towards Ryan, who reacted by creating a barrier in her way. Tightening her grip on her sword, the angel swung it forward, slicing the barrier in her path in two. The angel came before Ryan, her sword raised ready to bring it down on him when her movements stopped when she saw the smile on Ryan's face. Raising her head, she saw a solid barrier fell on her. She began moving her body to receive the attack when she felt her feet trapped in a barrier. Using more strength, she broke the barrier restraining her movements while swinging a slash at the barrier that fell on her. A shrill sound rang out as the sword of light and the barrier collided. Despite the frail appearance of her body, the angel had stopped the fall of the barrier which was several times her size, resisting the weight behind the attack, she gradually pushed back the barrier. Ryan, who had taken advantage of this opportunity to get away from the angel, once again formed numerous spike-shaped barriers around her as well as more solid barriers around the angel's arms to restrict her movements. Sensing a threat to her life, a white light shone in the angel's eyes before spreading across her body and growing rapidly, blinding Ryan. The sound of an explosion and shattering glass rang in his ears. The next moment, he felt his barrier shake violently, and some of his crystal essence drained in the process of maintaining it. A crater had appeared where the angel was standing a moment ago. She had now appeared before him with her sword of light in her hands, swinging it quickly in a furious assault on his barrier. As Ryan accessed his aurora collar, a white stone appeared in his hands. He made several seals with his hands and small inscriptions materialized around him before being printed on the stone, which shone brightly the next instant. Numerous elemental particles of light were released from the stone and quickly absorbed by Ryan's barrier. The barrier that trembled under each of the angel's furious assaults became more stable, resisting more easily to the angel's light elemental attack. Yet, despite the consumption rate of his crystal essence being reduced to maintain his barrier in place, he still felt his crystal essence being drained quickly under the attacks. Ryan frowned. Looks like I can't go any further than that. I should at least try to give it my all, he said, biting his lip. His face suddenly paled as a large amount of crystal essence disappeared from his spiritual world. A barrier suddenly formed around the angel's head. Collapsing barrier. The angel couldn't react to the apparition of the barrier around her head. The barrier suddenly began to compress on itself before exploding. Ryan smiled momentarily, but his face quickly turned somber when he saw the angel still alive with shattering particles of light falling to the ground. Despite protecting herself at the last moment with a layer of light, her face was still ruined by his attack, with half of her head bleeding profusely, but she looked at him with her eyes filled with cold light. An explosion of light manifested around the angel as the sword in her hands grew larger and more tangible. She raised the sword above her head before bringing it down on Ryan with all her strength. Ryan watched the sword fall. He no longer had enough crystal essence to maintain his barrier. He just looked at the angel with a smile as he whispered, Fuck it. The angel's sword sliced through the barrier and Ryan. The next moment, 
his vision sank into a world filled with white light. In another area of the academy, away from the heaven-reaching tower, a student with spiky dark blue hair was sleeping comfortably at the base of a tree with a soft pillow under his head and a look of satisfaction on his face. A girl appeared next to him, with dark red eyes and long, dark red hair. Her slender figure was accentuated by the uniform she wore and a vibrant touch was added by the presence of a crimson scarf wrapped around her neck. When Zhao, wake up, she said, her eyes staring at the sleeping student. The expression of satisfaction on Wen Zhao's face changed as if someone had pulled him out of a sweet dream. Give me five more hours, he replied, half asleep. The girl frowned at his reaction as she jumped and sat on him, trying to provoke a response from him, but he just adjusted his position and seemed to continue sleeping without caring about the weight falling on him. A vein appeared on the girl's forehead. She grabbed Wen Zhao by his uniform collar before lifting the upper part of his body and shaking him back and forth. Wake up, Liu Xing. Why are you waking me up? I was having a wonderful dream, he said, slowly waking up, his voice weak, as he yawned and rubbed his eyes while absent-mindedly looking at her. You, idiot. Someone took your place in the rankings. You dropped to 98. And Wen Zhao replied nonchalantly, rubbing his hair. Go challenge him to a duel, or at least take the tower trials to reclaim your spot. It should be easy for you if you put in some effort. Why would I do that? It takes too much effort. I could spend that time sleeping instead. Acting like that will make people think you're weak. It not like they will chase me in my dream. They can think whatever they want. It doesn't bother me, but it bothers me. The other students will dare to say that my fiancé is weak. Liu Xing raised her voice, clenching her small fists and gritting her teeth. She's cute when she acts like that, thought Wen Zhao as he stroked Liu Xing's head. W what are you doing? She said, surprised, a blush appearing on her cheeks. I just thought you were cute and wanted to pet you. See cute? Liu Xing's train of thought ceased as her entire face turned bright red. With a swift motion. Wen Zhao wrapped his arms around Liu Xing and pulled her down to lie with him. His hand moved over his pillow until it reached an inscription, which he activated with his crystal essence, falling asleep the next moment. Liu Xing suddenly snapped out of her stupor and looked at him before directing her gaze to the inscription on the pillow, a frown appearing on her face. All of this is Wen Xin's fault for giving you this pillow. Just wait until I catch you. Far from the two. Inside the Master Inscriptionist Association, in the President's office, Wen Xin was quietly sitting at his desk when he suddenly felt a chill down his spine, beginning to get up to leave Wen Zhao's embrace. Liu Xing stopped, staring at his sleeping face. Her frowning expression softened at the sight, and she lay back down beside him. I'll deal with him later, she said, closing her eyes. Angel, Wen Zhao and Liu Xing illustrations. Spoiler. Collapse. 7. Chapter 119, There's TV, when Ryan opened his eyes, he found himself in an empty room in front of an array formation. An ancient voice sounded, 25th floor failed. Ranking updated. Current ranking, 189th among second years. Accessing his academy account, he glanced at his merit points and saw the number 3290 displayed. A smile appeared on his face. With this amount of points, I might be able to take a class with the president of the Master Inscriptionist Association, Professor Wen Xin. The notifications on his Aurora collar suddenly caught his attention. Kieran is already out. I wonder what floor he reached. Walking to the array formation, he crossed it to join Kieran at the tower's base. A few seconds later, he saw Kieran waiting for him in front of the tower, waving his hand in his direction. How was it? Kieran asked. I was eliminated on floor 25. I was against an angel. I couldn't hurt her with simple attacks, so I tried to use all my crystal essence in a single attack, but it didn't do anything either. And you? Ryan replied. I was eliminated on floor 38. I had to face five lava beasts that constantly changed shape. Their attacks were difficult to predict. Floor 38? The gap between the two of us is still as big as ever. I thought I'd caught up with you a little. You recently break through to silver rank. It's already good that you can reach floor 25. You also just break through. I'm a double awakened. It's different. Maybe. Next month, I'll go higher than you, said Ryan with a determined look. Even though he knew he wouldn't be able to reach the same floor as Kieran any time soon, 
he wasn't ready to give up so easily. Good luck. Shouldn't you say you won't let me win easily? Do I really have to say it? Ryan sighed before changing the subject. Did you get enough merit points to purchase your movement technique? No, but I'm pretty close. I also got one hour of access to the elemental training ground. If you want to train in an elemental training ground, you will have to make an appointment. There are very few spots in these areas, and the training ground maintenance costs are high, with the number of students. The slots are often filled 24 hours in advance. While explaining to Kieran, Ryan checked the academy network. You have an open spot tomorrow around noon for the lava pit, the fire elemental training ground. I'll sign up then. What will you do about the remaining points you need? I'll accept some smithing tasks. Depending on your level in the inscriptions, we can also try forging an artifact together. Forged an artifact? I should be able to do it at my current level. We will need materials to serve as a catalyst for my inscriptions if we want to create one. So it's possible? Kieran asked his eyes shining. Yes, but the artifact level will be silver rank at best. It doesn't matter. We'll earn more merit points this way rather than doing tasks ourselves. That's not wrong. I'm going to find out about the tasks and catalysts we can use. We can try to create one during this week. What do you plan to do now? Kieran checked the time on his Aurora collar before deciding. I'm going to try the gravity manipulation training grounds. Okay. Call me if you need help with something. Okay. The two separated. Ryan headed towards the Master Inscriptionist Association while Kieran headed towards the training grounds. Checking the academy map as he walked, he arrived a few minutes later in front of a large dome. Entering inside, he was greeted by a large open training area where several students divided the space between them to train. A little further away were rectangular metal structures measuring several tens of meters each forming several hallways between them that extended over several kilometers. Each structure had a door with a screen next to it. Some of them were open, allowing a view of an empty training space inside, while others appeared to be locked. Looking around for a moment, Kieran walked towards one of the empty structures. These are the gravity manipulation training rooms written on the Academy website, he said once he arrived in front of one of them. Placing his hand on the screen next to the door. A notification appeared indicating that five academic merit points would be deducted to be able to use the room for the next hour. He quickly agreed before stepping inside. The door closed behind him. Checking the options the training room offered, he found that he could increase the gravity up to 5.0x. He would have to pay more merit points if he wanted to increase this threshold. That looks good. Closing his eyes, his consciousness entered his spiritual world which was still surrounded by a layer of crystal essence, where he saw Runahara occupying Luna with inscriptions. The little whale seemed to have fun chasing after them. Master, Luna. Runahara stopped manipulating the inscriptions when he saw Kieran. Do you finally remember that you have a master? Sorry, Kieran replied as Luna threw herself into his arms. Do you want to get out of here, Luna? Kieran asked, looking at the whale in his arms. Luna stirred in his arms as if to answer him. Can she come out? asked Runa Harul in turn. I'm in a private training room. There's no one there except me, and the room is big enough for her to go outside. Good, I won't have to take care of her for a while. Master doesn't want to go out. Why should I? There are options to display a holographic screen for watching TV or series. By the time Kieran finished his words, Runa Harul had already disappeared from his spiritual world. Kieran smiled at the sight and left his spiritual world with Luna. Back in the training room, he accessed the room's options under the impatient eyes of Runahara. I had a question for the master, he said suddenly as he continued to navigate through the options. What is it? Today, a strange phenomenon happened during a combat practice. Kieran began to explain his fight with Elzeria and how, with each interaction between their two elements, they merged together instead of clashing. Runaharal seemed lost in thought when he suddenly said, You asked me if I had children yesterday, but you didn't answer my question at that time. Have you met an elf with the same last name as me? Huh? Oh yes, she's the one I had my combat practice with. Her name is Elzeria Silnorin, Kieran replied, taken aback by the sudden change of subject. I see. I don't know what can cause this phenomenon, Runaharal said, a slight smile on his face. Kieran who was still browsing the room's options, didn't see this and frowned. 
I wonder why both of our elements are reacting like that. Finally finding the option he was looking for, a holographic screen appeared in a corner of the training room. Runa Harrell quickly sat down in front of it. What do you want to watch? Hmm. It's been several months since the last time I was able to watch a series. All the episodes must have been released by now. What was the name of the series again? Uck, I don't remember, that was this series with a demon who had to protect a human, but his powers had been transferred to the human, so he had to stay close to her to use them. Isn't this a drama? Don't you prefer an action series? No. It brings back cold memories. Kieran tilted his head. Not understanding what Runa Harrell meant. Maybe he knew demons? He thought. It's this one, my demon love coffee, said Runa Harrell, pointing to a series on the screen. Kieran started the series before turning back to Luna. Watch the series with Master or swim around the room. If you behave well, I'll try to take you out more often whenever I get the chance. The little whale circled several times in the air while sending him a message through their souls before starting to swim around. Kieran shook his head and walked towards the middle of the room. Activating a protective barrier to separate the area where Runa Harul and Luna were from the rest of the room, he activated an option to measure his crystal strength. The evaluation was quickly completed and displayed in front of him. Evaluation completed. Crystal strength level. 7675, taking into account his current level of crystal strength, he began to set the gravity of the room to maximum and set up a dummy to serve as his training partner. Once the adjustments were complete, he suddenly felt a weight all over his body, causing him to stumble for a moment before he regained his balance. He moved his arms several times before him, feeling how restricted his movements were. A smile appeared on his face, activating his abilities. He retrieved his double-bladed sword from his aurora collar and faced the training dummy, which did not seem to be influenced by the room's gravity. Taking a step forward to rush towards the dummy, a sound of explosion suddenly echoed through the room as his body was sent flying into a wall, while his face had the mark of a fist. Fuck. He spat blood on the ground before getting up. His sword moved quickly in front of him intercepting a metal fist that pushed him a step back, using all his strength to move his body under the gravity. He twirled his sword around himself, forcing the dummy back. While he was busy with the training dummy, and Runa Harrell was watching his series, without either of them noticing, Luna passed through the room wall without resistance as if it were water. Soft, happy noises escaped her as she wandered through the hallway separating the gravity manipulation training rooms, as if attracted by something. She headed towards one of the rooms and passed through the wall. An intense blue light suddenly filled her vision while a terrible pressure fell on her soul, paralyzing her in place. The horn on her forehead glowed for a brief moment, sending a call for help to Kieran. 6. Chapter 120 You forgot. Back in the training room, Kieran, who was resisting the assault of the training dummy as best he could, suddenly stopped when he felt Luna's call for help. Luna? He shouted looking around the room. He quickly deactivated the dummy and the barrier before rushing towards Runa Harrell. Master, where is Luna? Runa Harrell, who was immersed in his series, was surprised when he appeared next to him shouting, The little wheel? She was here a moment ago. Runa Harrell replied, checking around him. Kieran's face went white as he no longer received any messages from Luna. We have to find her quickly. He shouted as he ran towards the exit of the training room. Sensing the anxiety in his voice, Runa Harrell quickly stood up to follow him. Calm down. She is connected to your spiritual world. Try to feel her presence. As they ran through the hallways formed by the training rooms, Kieran focused on his spiritual world to sense Luna's presence. Over there, he said a moment later, turning in one direction. Let her be okay. Kieran thought anxiously as he used his crystal essence to rush forward sparing no amount to arrive a second earlier where he had sensed Luna's presence. A minute passed, during which each second seemed like an eternity to him. Finally, he arrived in front of the training room. Luna's presence came from behind the door. Without hesitation, Kieran knocked on the door several times. A few seconds passed as he anxiously waited in front of the door when it suddenly swung open, revealing a beautiful elf with long silver hair carrying a small whale in her arms while gently caressing it. Her face appeared as pale as his. Kieran, she says. Kieran was stunned. His brain stopped functioning for a moment at the sight. 
He had run here thinking something had happened to Luna, only to find her being patted in Elzeria's arms. Elzeria, a few moments earlier, while Luna crossed the wall of a training room, an attack made of compressed water headed toward her. The power behind the attack had paralyzed her in place, and overcome with fear, she sent a call for help to Kieran. Elzeria, who was training in the room, suddenly saw a small whale appearing in front of her attack. With no other choice, she forced her attack to dissipate by changing the path that her crystal essence took in her body, causing internal injuries that made her vomit a full mouth of blood and fall to her knees on the ground. Cough. She spat out another mouthful of blood. Her face became pale, and her body ached, but she forced herself to get up. A potion appeared in her hand, which she quickly swallowed her face regaining some color, but she still felt pain in all her body. Are you hurt? She said, looking at Luna with anxiety in her eyes to see if she was injured. Swimming toward her, Luna began to circle around her, making worried noises. Elzeria watched her swimming. What are you? She said as a dazzling smile appeared on her face as she grabbed Luna, who didn't resist, in her arms. This scene could have brought down many cities across the universe just at the sight of her smile and yet no one was there to witness such a scene. You're cute, said Elzeria as she caressed her. Happy noises escaped Luna, which made Elzeria smile even more. Are you a wandering soul? You must be bound to someone to be able to stay in this state. A slight trace of sadness crossed her eyes for a moment, but it quickly disappeared as she continued to pet Luna. A minute later, loud knocking sounds came from the room door. Elzeria frowned and walked towards the door with Luna in her arms. Opening the door, she saw Kieran standing in front of her. What are you doing here? She asked. I, hearing Kieran's voice, Luna struggled slightly before leaving Elzeria's arms and throwing herself into Kieran's arms. You, do you have any idea how worried I was? You should have sent me another message to let me know you were safe he said, lifting the small whale in front of his eyes, which seemed to curl up to become even smaller than she already was. The horn on Luna's head glowed slightly, using their bond to send him a message. You forgot, Luna nodded, making happy noises. Looking at her, he didn't know whether to laugh or cry. On her side, Elzeria looked at her hands with a feeling of loss. Looking up, she observed the interaction between the two. Her eyes fell on Kieran's face, which was pale and dripping with sweat. Were you worried about her? She asked. Yes. She suddenly disappeared and sent me a call for help. Sorry for any trouble she may have caused you, he replied. It's nothing, but you should be careful of her. Wandering souls are fragile. If she had entered another training room and an attack had hit her, she could have died. I know. I wanted to give her a bit of freedom, as she had been confined in my spiritual world since I arrived at the academy by letting her swim in my training room, but it seems I'll have to be stricter with her. Hearing Kieran's words, Luna began to tremble, trying to leave his arms. There are functions to block soul attacks in training rooms so that it does not pass through the room's walls. This should also prevent her from being able to pass through walls. Really? Thank you, Elzeria. Luna who was still struggling, managed to escape and threw herself into the arms of Elzeria, who welcomed her by caressing her. Elzeria's lips began to curl up, but she quickly restrained her smile and lifted her eyes to gaze at Kieran, who wore a betrayed expression in response to Luna's actions, forcing her to hold back another smile that threatened to appear at any moment. What are you doing in her arms? Kieran asked through his bond with Luna. Luna's horn glowed and a look of surprise appeared on his face. Her caress feels good, and her smile is pretty. Wait, you see her smile? Luna let out happy noises while he stared at Elzeria. Now that I think about it, I've never seen her smile. Thinking about the words of the other students and the elves, his expression darkened. How much she has suffered in the elven kingdom if even here, surrounded by different races. She is treated like this, clenching his hands into a fist. He looked at Elzeria whose eyes were fixed on Luna as she gently caressed her. Feeling his gaze, she raised her eyes to meet his. What's wrong? She asked. Ah, uh, nothing. Kieran forced a smile before an idea popped into his mind. Have you finished your training? If you don't mind, can I ask you a favor? I'm done for today. Do you need my help? Luna seems bored alone in the training room, and since she seems to like you, would you mind coming with us to keep her company? Elzeria looked at Luna in her arms before nodding. Okay, thanks. The smile on Kieran's face widened. Behind him, 
Runa Harul watched the interaction between the two without saying a word, but from the light shining in his eyes, he seemed to enjoy the situation more than his series. Compared to Luna, who was only bound to Kiran's spiritual world, Runa Harul was connected to his soul and could only be seen by him. Kiran had long since learned to accept Runa Harul's presence, no longer paying attention to it, allowing him to watch the scene before him like an invisible spectator. After accepting, Elzeria followed Kiran to his training room. Once inside, her gaze landed on the holographic TV, which had an episode playing on it. What is this? she asked. Kieran paused for a moment before coming up with an explanation, it's a series Luna watches to keep herself occupied. Elzeria nodded and moved in front of the holographic TV before sitting down with Luna on her lap. Runa Harrell followed, glancing toward Kieran, who quickly understood by putting the episode back to where it was when they left the room. Accessing the room's options, he searched for the option Elzeria had told him about before activating it. He then reactivated the barrier that separated him from Elzeria and the others, as well as the gravity and the training dummy. Taking his double-bladed sword from his Aurora collar, he rushed towards the training dummy, transforming into a lichen. As time slowly passed in the training room, Elzeria occasionally glanced in his direction. 6. Chapter 121 Discomfort Next, an hour later, Kieran was lying on the training room floor his chest rising and falling rapidly as he tried to catch his breath. His body was drenched in sweat, and numerous injuries could be seen on him. A shadow appeared above him, accompanied by a cold sensation on his cheek. He instinctively raised the upper part of his body to sit up and saw Elzeria crouched in front of him, holding a cold soda can in her hand. Here, she said, extending the can towards him. Thanks, Kieran replied taking the can and drinking all the contents as if he hadn't had a drink in days. Elzeria looked at him for a moment, her eyes moving to the injuries on his body. Do you always train like this? Yes. I try to give my all every time I train. Why are you training so hard? Because I am weak, he said, his expression turning somber as his gaze fell upon Luna lying beside Runa if I weren't so weak and had made different choices, many things could have changed. She wouldn't have become a wandering soul. Elzeria remained silent, fixing her gaze on Kieran's eyes. So, he too can make such an expression? Until now, I had always seen him smile. A subtle pain pulsed in her chest. It was as if a tiny shard of glass had pricked her heart, sending a wave of discomfort through her. She placed her right hand over her heart and furrowed her brow not understanding where this discomfort came from. Her crystal essence traveled through her body, searching for any anomalies. Did Luna cause you some trouble? Kieran suddenly changed the subject, and a smile reappeared on his face as if it had never left. No, she's quite calm, Elzeria said as she stood up. The discomfort she felt a moment ago seemed to disappear just as it had come. Have you finished your training? Kieran checked the time before nodding. Yeah, it's getting late and Ryan will be waiting for me to go to the cafeteria. Do you want to come with us? Okay. Kieran thought that she would refuse again and that he should insist, but to his surprise, she quickly accepted. He stood up the next second, Luna. Hearing his call, Luna reluctantly swam towards him before entering his spiritual world. Let's go. The two started walking through the academy towards the cafeteria. On the way. Kieran sent a message to Ryan to let him know that he would be arriving soon. As they approached the bustling cafeteria, the two could smell the aroma of various dishes filling the air and the hum of conversation from the students enjoying their meals. After getting their food, they found Ryan sitting at a table and rejoined him. Ryan looked up as the two approached, a slight smile appearing on his face when he saw Elzeria. Then his gaze fell on Kieran's appearance, who looked exhausted and beaten. What happened to you? You look like shit, said Ryan. Still better than you, Kieran replied, sitting down in front of him. It only took one exchange for the two to start arguing with each other. Elzeria sat calmly, observing the interaction between the two brothers while eating. I bet you trained with a training dummy again and got beat up. You have a weird fetish, Ryan said. Are? I already told you I don't have any weird fetish. I can't find a training partner at any time. But if you want, you can serve as my training partner, Kieran replied. Memories flooded into Ryan's mind, and his face paled. Let. 
Let's avoid that. I have a busy schedule between training my ability and improving my inscriptions. I don't have time to serve as your training partner. Why don't you ask Alziria? He said, trying to escape the situation he had caused. Kieran turned to Elziria before shaking his head. She's much stronger than me. She would waste her time with me as her training partner. It doesn't bother me, said Elziria, who had been silent until then. Then it's settled, Ryan said quickly as he started to eat. You don't need to help me. I can use training dummies, Kieran said, lowering his voice. It's nothing, and if you don't want my help, I'll take care of Luna while you train. Thanks. Changing the subject. Kieran looked at Ryan and asked, Were you able to find the catalysts you can use to forge an artifact? I have some ideas, but I'm not sure yet. It will take me a few more days to prepare if we don't want to waste materials unnecessarily. Kieran nodded and began to eat as well. After finishing their meal, the three left the cafeteria before separating to go to their respective dormitories. Walking alone, Kieran thought about the dinner and Elzeria's words. Looks like she opened up a little. Dividing part of his consciousness into his spiritual world, he observed Luna, it's probably thanks to you that it happened. A faint smile adorned his face as he entered his room. After taking a shower to clean his body of all the sweat from the training, he sat cross-legged on his bed, closing his eyes. The next moment, he found himself in his spiritual world. A yellow sun as big as a house pulsing with a cloud of crystal essence rotating around it overhung its two crystal trees. Under the sun was an orb as large as himself made of pure crystal essence. It shone with a radiant glow, without impurities. It's time to check how beneficial this orb is for cultivation, he said. As he sat down in front of the orb, closing his eyes, Kieran focused on the orb. The thread of crystal essence escaped from the orb before leaving his spirit world, entering his bloodstream and beginning to nourish it. The crystal essence slowly seeped into each drop of blood, passing through each of his veins, then continued its path, reaching his bones, strengthening and fortifying them, continuing to direct the crystal essence through his skin, tendons, muscles, organs, brain, and bone marrow. A rotation of the heavenly sun body was completed before he redirected the crystal essence within his spiritual world to nourish his crystal trees and finally merge with the cloud of crystal essence rotating around the yellow sun. Exhaling a long breath, his focus shifted to the rotating yellow sun. Guiding the crystal essence that formed the yellow sun towards its center, he compelled it to compress, pushing the sun's brilliance to condense. The once expansive sphere gradually diminished its golden glow becoming more concentrated, maintaining a steady concentration, Kieran synchronized his breath with the compression of the yellow sun. The condensing energy inside was like a volcano on the verge of eruption, threatening to escape his control at any moment, but he did his best to control it. Time passed slowly, and the yellow sun, which had once been the size of the house, was now reduced to the size of Kieran. Once the sun was stable again, he released his control over it and it resumed its rotation. The gravitational force increased several folds, and the cloud of crystal essence circling around it was quickly attracted and absorbed, increasing its size slightly. Looking again in the direction of the orb, he gathered another thread of crystal essence from it before repeating the rotation. One, 